Yeah, this is the last podcast of the 2023 cut to it season. How about that? Mm-hmm. Um, Coley, since it's Christmas, time has passed. Um, you know, how was your year thus far? Uh, not one of my favorite years. I can say that pretty comfortably. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I've, I've had better times, but on this program, big fan, loved everything yeah. we did. I think we're, we're really found something with you breaking down rookie wide receiver classes. That's coming right up at the top of the year. That's right around the corner. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to that to set off 2024. How about yourself? How did you enjoy 23? Year of 2023. Um, a lot of travel this year, a lot of travel, a lot of uh, more traveling than I would have expected for myself. Um, just to kind of give you right a overhead view. Um, I'm heading to Cleveland for Thursday night. This will be the last Thursday night football. And not including Germany and not including London. With these 13 days that I've missed. How many days do you believe Agent 89 has stayed, and I only stay at Marriott's? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shout out to University of Utah alumni. Just wanted to. Um, uh, so a Bonvoy member, minus my 13 days, how many days do you think I've stayed in a hotel? Uh, I'm going to say like 107. Mm, that's actually the exact number. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) It really is. Now, if you add that, right, I would have stayed 120 days in a hotel. But here's the part I think people, well, I know for sure people don't always factor in. That does not include the travel day, right? Like all hours on travel. So... I mean, 120 days, you got to think about one of those days does not count as a travel day. Right. So, bro, you took uh, to almost 200 days. Yeah. Yeah, it's a third of you. I spent a third of the year in a hotel. So, That's crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a ton. Uh, some obviously are, re- are repeat, right? Sure. Shot most interesting jobs in Dallas. Went back to Dallas for Thursday night, right? So, but however, it's, it's still... It is what it is. Big yeah. continental breakfast guy. No, I just take the points. I don't take the breakfast <laughs> credit. I take the points. <laughs> my whole goal. My whole goal is to get a million Marriott points. I have I, eight hundred and twenty-three thousand. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm always, I'm always trying to get my points, man. Always trying you to need get my them. points. You need yeah. him now. Uh, someone that didn't get many points yesterday, Brock Purdy, uh, our 49ers, yeah, needed, needed a couple more points on the board. Uh, it was a tough night, tough night for the discourse. People, he was the, the heavy favorite for MVP coming into that game. Him and Christian McCaffrey were having the giggles. No, he's the MVP. No, you're the MVP. No, he's the MVP. Neither from the MVP when they woke up this morning, Lamar Jackson <laughs> stole it. Ran off with it, took it back. Snatched Walmart. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What did What did you see in that game? What's 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 How How should us Forty Nine ers fans respond to a beating like that? Those fans, or we will talk about this later. Is the or the Kansas City fans? Right. This one is concerning because it's a pot. Yesterday, I took. Well, last week I talked about this. Is probably a preview. Oh, the Super Bowl. And because it's potentially a preview of the Super Bowl, I I loved part of the MVP conversation um, with uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. I thought it was a little bit much, way too much salt. And and I'm emphasizing, I'm going to just call it, I I must – there's a group of people, right? There's always a group of people that love to make everything about race. So, you know, I, so I'll give it the race. Oh, they were loving the salt, not talking about enough pepper. And I agree. 
I, you like how I did that? That's very funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it takes a little bit of the 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 stinger off, right? Sure, you know, say, sure. hey, a little yeah. bit of salt, not enough pepper. <laughs> sure. I believe they're just the excitement of Christian McCaffrey. That's what I'm going with. What I did not really like that I didn't hear enough of, we talked about Brock Purdy. They talked about Brock Purdy, who deserves, in this game, deserves all of the MVP conversation. Deserves it. Now it's Brock Purdy said, no, it's actually CMC who makes it go. So when your quarterback is telling the world, it's really not me, it's the people around me, kudos, mm-hmm. great job. That's what quarterbacks are supposed to do, right? Uh, when everything's going great, I was taught, never took it, but when everything's going great, you do this. When everything's going bad, you do this. The problem that I had in a broadcast had to do with as the game is unraveling, and it was first and second quarter was exactly the football game that we all sat up and waited for. And the game, all in all, was a pretty good game. Mm -hmm. I thought it was an exciting game. I did not think it was a buzzkill or a letdown. But I don't believe that they should have went on and on and on and on about CMC being the MVP when it was clearly they were the 49ers were losing at this time. And I did not hear as much enthusiasm from Joe Buck and Troy Aikman of how Lamar Jackson is in the MVP conversation, but how he should, they should have been peppering that on as much as they were oohing and eyeing over CMC. And this is at this time, third and fourth quarter, they're up 33, 30. They're up by, you know, they're up 16, 20. So much of the score in the third, third heading in the fourth quarter, I believe it should have been a lot more enthusiasm, excitement, bass in their voice to talk about how Lamar Jackson is in the MVP category, how what he's doing. They only just had a whole bunch of stats on CMC. Right. As if, as if. They were winning a football game. <laughs> and 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 I'm a 49ers fan. Love CMC. I know him. Know Lamar. Know the Ravens. I, I'm just saying, when I was watching a football game, I know the prepping that you do before, especially in-game, which is so, so much different. I, I just enjoy doing the preseason. I don't have uh, – I just don't have the bandwidth to do games. Because it's a lot of information. And they just didn't seem to have as much information, graphics, statistics, detailedness that they have they had on CMC. As if Lamar was out there hurt. It's it's very strange because so much of the offseason was dominated by Lamar contract talk. And people saying he wouldn't live up to it. The I'll say this, not 89, the likely collusion uh the nfl had to not make sure the rest of the league didn't offer him a contract the ravens weren't willing to match things of that nature adam schefter and rich eisen got into a back and forth you don't see adam schefter and other people's mentions often he's a straight out guy he's he's tweeting information out he's usually not mixing it up so people are still it's not as fun of a storyline the nfl loves a good storyline Lamar, not only living up to his contract in year one after people said he might not deserve it, but now looking like the MVP again, a two-time MVP. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are in a spot, these league partners are in a spot to talk about how much he overcame just in this calendar year. Not We're not talking five years worth of of coming over something. We're talking about six months of, hey, yeah. should we even pay this guy? Oh, let's give him a big deal. Is he really worth it? They're the one seed, and he's the MVP right now. That's no. a better story than they had prepared to talk about last night, and I don't think they can talk about all of it. Yeah, they. it, it just wasn't – like, I'm watching a game, and I'm like, yo, you know, in the, in the first or second quarter, it was a really good game. I mean, it was, what, 5-2? to 10-5, yeah. <laughs> right? It, it was <laughs> – it was a lot of stuff going on. You're like, whoa. There, in one hand, you expected 
the defensive stalemate back and forth, both defenses really giving offenses a hard time. And you even saw at times in the beginning, Lamar Jackson was under the rest. You got the safety, right, making that bad decision. Brock Purdy making that bad decision, leading Debo Samuels into the end zone where, hey, I just every quarterback would have thrown that ball. He was open in the National Football League. That is considered open. Now, how he led him was the mistake. Also, I talked about Kyle Hamilton. Some people uh, were saying, Steve, he's back. What are you, uh, somebody said, Mofo. What are you talking about, Mofo? Well, I'm talking about if, and I stated, Kyle Hamilton will impact this game, whether it's blitzing, running. And you, they mentioned he has an MCL sprain. So I'm talking about coming back where he can impact the game and not show like a Jalen Hurts, right, or some of these other guys, or we'll talk about it, Trevor Lawrence, where there are weeks of injuries or the, the whole football season is now oozing out of their pores of the injuries that they have, whether even Patrick Mahomes, you saw him getting up grimacing, right? This is the time of year you start to see players where the mini car crashes of the game starts to really wear down on guys and they have to have extra overtime in rehab, doing a lot of different things. You got duct tape, uh, paint tape, tinfoil, WD-40. You're using oil, using everything under the sun to try to get your body to wake up not during the week, bro. Wake up on Sunday and feel like what happened last month did not actually happen. So now that there is this 17th game that the NFL introduced last season, 49ers-Ravens feels like it could be a rivalry. They only play every four years, but there, there's something special about these two teams matching up. They're typically good on a year-to-year -year basis. There's not a lot of lean years for these two franchises. I would like to see them play every two years they like that 17th game every every other year every year would be insane that these two teams like you you need a cupcake every once in a while you don't need I, to be smashing your head against one of the other best teams in the league every yeah, year I'm, I'm every right other year 49ers oh. ravens on the schedule please and thank you yes let's go through this real quick i just off the cuff man quarterback rivalries th that you believe are the next Peyton or the Manning and Brady rivalry. So for me, I, I would say the Lamar Brock Purdy. Okay. Okay. I you know, think... obviously Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow and um and Mahomes. And, and Mahomes. Yeah. Allen and Lawrence. That was interesting. I don't hate that one. I'm trying to think court Jalen Hurts and Dak. Jalen Hurts and Dak. How about Dak and other people? Jalen Hurts and other people. I, I sure. just looking at the young talent that's out there. I, I, Mahomes and Allen. I would or Mahomes and and Lamar should be to me. Those are the two best quarterbacks in the league. So that's where it should be. But I feel I like don't, I don't. I don't like the Kansas City and Baltimore right now. Mm -hmm. So everybody's making. A stink about about Mahomes, and you heard the Raiders uh, DBs talk about um, he doesn't have that magic. What I find more of a conversation is less about the magic and understanding and figuring out when you have when you have what Patrick Mahomes has is such a greedy. Mentality, and what I say when I when I mention greedy with Patrick Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes very rarely is going to take what the defense gives him. He does, and and that to his to his credit, that's what makes him really good. For sure, again against the Raiders, that's what made him look really bad. When I was watching Patrick Mahomes run around, it reminded me of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers championship Super Bowl. When he was running for his life, and I think he was running for like, I think it was two, three, I don't remember the exact number, but it was a couple of hundred yards 
He was scampering in the backfield, running away from people. Right. Because of the rush. The problem that you see and go back into that game is this offense that that Andy reruns is an old school West Coast offense. When I watch Patrick Mahomes, he's not going to take what the defense gives him. There are times, man, he was scrambling around. Check down was right there. And he's not going to go there. When I was watching a game, it's not Patrick Mahomes' magic is leaving. But these wide receivers for the Kansas City Chiefs are just at the current moment are not up to speed in the way this offense can fire on all cylinders. But Patrick Mahomes hasn't lost his magic. Patrick Mahomes is playing football with some players who are a year or two behind. Now, when I say a year or two behind, you're too behind to know exactly who they are and what you can expect from them. How difficult is it? Because it was late in the game. I believe it was 20 to 14. Yeah, it was 20 to 14. The Raiders had the ball. Third down, Zamir White had like a 50-yard run, and it gets tackled from behind uh, by McDuffie. How hard is it for an NFL player, especially a defender, to just not tackle that guy? Because their only chance at that point, it was about to hit the two-minute warning, they were just going to knee it out. How hard is it to let that guy score? Because it goes against all your instincts, but it's truly the only chance you have to win that game at that point. It's tough. I, I didn't play defense in a league, and, and in high school I didn't play enough. Oh, at high school too. In, like you can't expect a high right. school kid to yeah, have and, that kind but of. But I, I just I was never I was never really coached up in those situations, right? So I'm not necessarily sure. Well, no from the of, offensive side, if you were to get a uh, a pass, like if I'm it was scoring. third, I'm you're scoring, scoring every time. <laughs> you're not no, going I'm down scoring. the one. <laughs> I, I've never had a conversation where they say don't score. I've never, I've, no one has ever had that conversation, and I haven't engaged in any conversation <laughs> that would, that would, like, I'm not. Hey, do you want me to? Hey, if I break out now, do, should I score or just take? I, I don't. I have never engaged in that conversation, and no one has ever engaged me in that conversation. Because what, what was so I'm it? not sure. Was it Nick Chubb against the Jets last year where he scored at the end of the game and it, it put him up like 14? This should be over, and then the Jets end up winning the game. Everyone's like, "Well, come on, Nick Chubb, how did you? How did you not think your defense? Yeah, how did you not give- think that your yeah give up 14 <laughs> straight points, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, or like the Ravens last the Ravens last night scored in 18 seconds, right? Two touchdowns in 18 seconds. So I saw that one coming. Right, exactly. Huh? Yeah. They don't was, stop it. That, but it's like, <laughs> I've seen defenses like, it's very rare. It happens maybe once every three seasons. We'll carry a guy into the end zone just to be like, yes. all right, this is our. So, like, is that conversation is not happening that frequently. It's really not because it rarely, it, think about it, I don't know, it rarely happens. Right. It, it literally, what they do coach you up on, which, when stay we're balanced. running the ball, when we're in, when we're in four minute, two minute offense, stay up. Don't go out of bounds. That is coached up. Sure. But to say don't score, I either have not been paying attention, <laughs> I was not involved in the meeting, or I just was asleep. You're out. I've that never. Day. I, didn't say I have <laughs> never been instructed or heard or ear hustled to say, hey, if you make this. Don't score. I've never it, and you know you know how people are. Well, obviously because you 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 didn't win a Super Bowl. Thanks for reminding me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. I maybe I'll sleep well tomorrow. No, <laughs> um, I'm gonna spend it on you. Do okay. you believe that Antonio Pierce wins the Raiders head coaching job by beating Kansas City Chiefs? I would have said he should have got it like two weeks ago. It, it's oh, obvious. 63? Oh, that, I, that was last week. I'm just like, I'm, I, you can't make any decisions based off that. That yeah. that was chaos. But yeah. it seemed like the second he got there, at least the defensive side of the ball really started to lock in and look like a Raiders defense from like when I was a kid. Tough, hard nosed running after the ball, playing with their hair was on fire. Maybe a couple dirty hits here and there sprinkled in throughout. That's Raiders football. 
That's what he seemed to instill. Now, the offensive side of the ball, Aiden O'Connell didn't complete a pass after the first quarter. That's yeah. not Pierce's fault. You know what I mean? That's the rookie quarterback learning the league probably shouldn't Are be you... a starter anyways. Wow. So you just said another rookie quarterback? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that happened. It's been fi- let, I, it's been 58 different quarterbacks have started this season. Is that not crazy? Uh, 58. I've seen a couple people say it. Hats off to Roger Goodell for selling this product as well as he has because this is... <laughs> This has not been a year to remember. Like the the MVP conversation has been so funny this year because every week it's like it's Purdy, it's McCaffrey, it's it's this guy, it's Lamar, it's that guy, Tyreek, uh, Tyreek, yeah. Every CJ CJ Stroud, Stroud had it for a minute. Every yep. year, and it happens sometimes. There was that stretch where Ladanian Tomlinson set the record for rushing touchdowns, and Sean Alexander broke it. Priest Holmes before that, so it was like, oh, yeah, that's the obvious MVP because this guy did something no one's done before. Then you get uh, Brady throwing fifty touchdowns; he's the MVP. Yep. Manning breaks that record; he's the MVP. Mahomes comes along; he's the MVP. Some years it's so clear because we've seen something we've never seen before; it's so obvious. Then you get years like this where it's just a slog. No one's doing something we've never seen. And we've seen all this before. League-wide, we've seen it before. And people don't know what to do with that. It drives them insane. So how can someone be an MVP if he's not historically dominant? Well, he's the best player in the league this year. That's what we're – he's not up against the last 50 years. He's up against this (laughs) year. That's how it goes. Antonio Pierce – I don't, I don't know how I feel because some interim coaches, you saw it with Wilkes last year in Carolina. He came in, that team started playing better. Antonio Pierce comes in, your place is Josh McDaniels. The team's playing better. How will he look with the whole offseason? You would assume better, but every interim coach who seems to get this tag, for whatever reason, it doesn't always work out. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. What is it when a new guy comes in? It breathes some new life into the season. And then what happens that next year? Because Frank Reich's like an all-time interim guy. And we've seen it not always work when he's had a full off season, full season, yeah. full camp, and all that. It's a touch. It's it's very touchy because of the lack of experience sometimes the interim coach has. Right, the interim coach has taken over because generally, and this is and this this is not me throwing something against the wall and hoping it stick. Generally, sure. this is what happens when a coach gets fired. That means, generally, it is so dysfunctional. Sure. And things are so bad that they're concerned about the way it will impact the remaining season, the remaining games. It will impact the players on the field to where it will be impossible to go another day. And then I talked to some people there, and, and I respect the heck out of Josh uh, McDaniel. Well, there were some people telling me, man, Josh had such great conversations leading up to his first meeting. The guys like, all right, we got a new, we we got a, a Super Bowl champ, offensive coordinator, head coach. He's gonna come in here and do some things. First meeting, I mean, hit hit the <laughs> recorder, best just bump the DJ booth in the middle of the party. Guys walked out of the meeting room like, wow. This is what we got to deal with. Yeah. So there were so many things going on. So back to that Antonio Pierce. I don't know if he deserves to be the head coach, but I sure love what he's doing. Yeah, I I would say, and I think if yeah, I would say I just I he deserves the chance to fail just like any other coach does, and I'm not saying he Dennis Allen fail. he got Dennis Allen got. Hit twice, right? And it might he should get fired this year. <laughs> right, well, that's that's what I like. We were talking salt and pepper earlier. If he was salt, it would, he'd already have the contract, I believe. Hmm. There's, I mean, Bomani yeah. Jones has, has said it a couple of times. Um, like black head coaches often only get uh, the job as interim, and then it never becomes full time. And then they have to go somewhere else as another coordinator and try all over again. It's kind of like the enemy. He had to go to Washington to assume they were going to fire Ron at some point and then take no, that no, over. No, well, no. Y'all got to find that clip. What did I say with Ron? I, I said he was coaching. I expected 
Eric Bien to be to become the head coach. Right, exactly. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's right. Why. I'm talking about during the season. Right. Oh, yeah, I yeah. expected him to be during the season. Now, I did hear Eric Bien was running practice and training camp because of the type <laughs> of training camps uh, offensively. The type of training camp Ron Rivera was doing, he just wasn't used to uh, the resort. The forward pass. <laughs> I would give Pierce the, the opportunity to fail because – if, especially if they're going to go retread or somewhere else, like you have something new, you have something that's working and you have at least your players bought into this guy. Yeah. Build a culture, build something. The guys on the field are actually excited about. Don't just try and do the thing that you've been doing and failing at for years already. What has happened in Houston this year, with D'Amico Ryans, they go out, they get a rookie quarterback. They have a lot of off at, uh, emphasis on offense side of the ball. And he was a defensive coordinator. I don't know that so many people are afraid of hiring defensive minded guys because of the offense, but Houston's shown you this year, it can be done. It's not it impossible. Can. Tua is it a different can. example. Yeah. I think he needs this quick timing offense that Mike McDaniel yes. has yes. instituted. I think they're more of a perfect fit than GM and head coach. Yes. I don't know that your GM and head coach need to be best friends to get stuff done. No, they don't. They have to agree. They have to agree because there's a ton of conversation. Sure. I, I've I've stated that I don't trust defensive minded coaches. I don't st- I don't trust defensive minded coaches because I don't believe that they're as open minded offensive minded coaches. When you look at some of the offensive minded coaches, what they do is offensive minded coaches they they get a potential head coach or head coach candidate that runs the defense. He goes, the offensive-minded coaches, I've noticed they go, hey, I got the offense. Right. You got the defense. Don't muck this up. I'm not playing safe ball. (laughs) We're (laughs) playing good ball, right? And Matt LaFleur, they talking about Barry. See how he's – his name is getting thrown out as, hey, he's he's hurting his defense because – He's in charge of doing a lot of stuff. You talk about Kyle Shanahan and San Francisco 49ers. There's been, there was some rumblings earlier in the year. Steve Wilkes, he will not lose his play caller responsibilities. Raheem Morris with Sean McVay. He's literally taking care of all the defense. Sean McVay does the offense. D'Amico Ryans has that offensive-minded management style where the defense is the defense, but he's allowing, I think it's Bobby Sloan. Yeah, uh, Slonick, something like that. Slonick, Bob, Bob yeah. Slonick, to do his thing. And so you have have a little bit of that. Peyton, uh, Peyton, Sean Payton, his offense, to his detriment at times. Uh, right? He's let Vance Joseph, but then Vance Joseph has also – done some great things, and they re- they just released Keenan Jackson. Yeah. Uh, Kareem. Kareem Jackson, Kareem which yeah. is mind-boggling to me. I don't know what the heck is going on with that one. But anyway, so you ha- that's why I'm suspect on defensive-minded coaches, right? I'm biased because I've also seen how defensive-minded coaches, what they do. Brian Dayball, another guy. So – my my prejudice against defensive coordinators is they micromanage versus manage. I think when I think of Belichick, who is a, a defensive minded coach, yes, I th- I think he views the game risk management style, and that's why yes. when he gets to Super Bowls, they're not ever blowouts. It's always thirteen three. I mean, the, the Panthers Patriots Super Bowl was a high scoring affair, which which really hadn't replicated itself until we played the Falcons. Like it was always low twenties, grinded out games because he's like, the less mistakes we make, the better chance we have of winning late. Yeah. And just having that last Correct. possession to win yeah. the game. So I I definitely agree with you there. However, he's knocking on the, the wins record. So that's where it's also like, I see yeah, both yeah. sides of it. Yeah. But you're always going to, you're always going to get an outlier. Bill Belichick sure. is an outlier. There, there's guys who are outliers like, Oh, big, tall, lengthy guys don't have speed. Oh, Megatron, 
Sure, uh, sure. T.O., yeah, yeah. There's Brandon outliers. Moss. There's always there's always these outliers. But there's also one thing we've talked about the two years we've done this show, which is every team right now, most of the league is running the exact same offense as one another. Just, yeah. So that's Their where foundation if, is is the same. If you're hiring right now, I think there's a benefit to to zagging to being like, all right, well, if I hire a defensive guy, that gives us an advantage because we have a better defense now. And and if yeah, we're yeah, playing yeah. the same offense every single week and our defense is set, now we don't have to, if our offense is with a rookie quarterback, there's not as much stress on him because we know our defense is elite. That's where I think Houston got it right finally. Yes, that Houston got it right. It's just, it, it just is, it's unique. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I just look at them differently and I look at them like, you know, what's the why or, you know, what's the positive, what's the negative. And when you just look at defensive minded guys, I think over time, their teams are decent. They're good, right? You remove Bill Belichick, but defensive minded guys at some point when they find themselves backed into a corner, they almost go over the top to trying to find a solution to the point of where they create, the, they they risk so much. And a great example, New York Jets. Robert Silas, defensive-minded coach, is so much trying to get it right that they, yes, they get Aaron Rodgers, and no one foreseen Aaron Rodgers tearing his Achilles. But look at all of how bad the offense looks without Aaron Rodgers. Oh, yeah. They got a two-headed monster that you don't – they don't get a ball of Brees Holmes. It, it's just so much stuff that goes on. It's like a – it's like a soap opera. Oh, yeah. Big time. So, I, I, I think he – I think he should get it. I think Tony O'Pierre should get it. I also know that things in an interview process can go awry. Uh, call me old fashioned. I feel like he's been interviewing since he took over this job. And, oh, yeah, 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 and yeah, that yeah. proof, I know this isn't how it works, which is why I'm saying it. That yeah. proof should be m- way more than what some guy says at a big fancy boardroom with a whiteboard. Yeah, where he's but selling sometimes you, a dream. you can, but you could be in a boardroom and some people say some stuff. You're like, man, he, he forgot he was on a, in an interview. huh? <laughs> <laughs> Like, did he just say what I think he said? I can't imagine um, Belichick was the best interviewer uh, back in the day. And Kraft spoke about he hired him because of how he worked when he was with the Patriots under uh, Parcells. Uh, yeah. So I, I can't imagine he was knocking him dead in those uh, interviews. It was also t- 20 plus years ago now. So I'm sure it was yeah. a little bit different than it is right now. Not as corporate, not as buttoned up. Uh, but I'm all year we've come on this show. We've talked about. Should Belichick be fired? The noise is really loud. And I've said no. I've said it's insane to fire this man. You can't do it. It's disrespectful. He can stay as long as he wants. I've changed my tune. Winning that game is the most fireable offense he's ever done. That was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. How on earth do you blow that? What are we doing here? We're staring at the number two pick. Damn near looking at the number one overall pick. You beat the Broncos. The amount of times we've gone to Denver and gotten our teeth kicked in with Super Bowl contending rosters, I can't even count them. Tom Brady had a losing record against the Broncos in Denver during his time on the Patriots. And now we go and beat them. They're playing for their playoff lives. They're seven and seven. They'd be a game behind the Chiefs if they win this game. And now they're they're out of the playoff picture entirely. They're seven and eight because Sean Payton can't figure out a game plan to beat Bailey Zappi. Disgusting. I've never been so disgusted with the Patriots. <laughs> In my 34 <laughs> years of life, I couldn't believe what I was watching. Well, Oi, I don't even know what to say. I, I was surprised at first of all, I'm in studio and it is a sleeper, a snooze fest. <laughs> Goodness gracious. That first half, I'm like, this is terrible. Another banger oh. of a suit, by the way. The all green oh, looked pre- unbelievable. Oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. I, I had to switch the pants up to black, my wife told me. It was way too much green. I had green pants. She was like, mm, way too much. Between the green jays, she was like, oh, way too much green, way too much green. So I'm glad, glad I listened to her because it would have been way too much green. I would have been a green screen. <laughs> <laughs> They're putting graphics replays across your chest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 
I don't know what to take from that game is did New England screw up a, a top draft pick or is Sean Payton with Russell Wilson in trouble for the 2024 season? That, they looked in trouble the second Sutton went down because Russ, Russ tried to throw five interceptions that the Patriots were whopping. <laughs> And they, Russ, they get the ball back. They're making this comeback. They get two point conversion, another two point conversion. I'm feeling good. I'm going. Let's go, Russ. Let him cook. And boy, did he have nothing. He didn't have salt. He didn't have pepper. <laughs> he didn't have Season. chicken. He didn't have anything. <laughs> the propane was out. He couldn't turn the uh, stove on. I was sick. And and Chad Ryland, I the second they lined up for that field goal, this guy can't hit anything. He couldn't hit an extra point. Couldn't hit a chip shot. He's missing the net when he's warming up on the sideline. 56-yarder drilled it cold. I, you got to be kidding me. Tell us how you really feel. Oh, I was so sick. You're, you're a killer, and I'm watching the game going, I'm waiting for something that's noteworthy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculously bad the offensive line for the for the Broncos they're 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 doing their best people are talking about uh make of the conversation or the exchange Sean Payton and Russell Wilson were not exchanging Sean Payton was <laughs> reprimanding him that's what that was Russ did not talk back you know how when you just do something you know you know what there's nothing I can really say so let me just be quiet yeah. So he just took it, but I, I'm the Broncos are Dude, the, this, so based off of everything you just said, does Bill Belichick is he the head coach for the New England Patriots next year? Well, it's it's another thing too for the people who do genuinely want him fired. Look across the sideline at that bozo who can't even beat a three win team, Sean Payton. He went for a one and a two off TV last year. You're telling me someone wouldn't trade at least a one for Bill Belichick this off? Of course they would. Of course they would. So that's where you can't. Here's the, pro- here's the problem, though. Finding a situation where he, he's given the authority to be both head coach and general manager. Someone, a team just fired both of those hold, hold, guys. I don't really care what it takes to, to make the meal. When you tell me the price, I expect it to be really, really good. Sure. When I get up to the window and I give you my debit card, I give you the cash. Sure. That, that's that's all that's all I care about. I don't care that you had to slush through how many uh, uh, puddles of water or feet of snow or how many different uh, trucks that you I, – I don't care. Don't care. I don't want to know how the meal is made. I just want a grade A five-star meal. Or at least whatever that review is sure. that I can expect. And I and I just feel like that things are getting dicey. And we look at people's resume and we give people the benefit of the doubt of what they've done in the past. And I agree with it, especially when you talk about Bill Belichick and what he's done in the past. You can't overlook that. You can't say he's lost it. I don't believe he's lost it. I think he needs to make a just. Yeah. And I think it needs to be on, as we, from our previous conversation, the offensive side of the ball, because the defense this year, even with the injuries and with Jack Jones getting waved and looking like a superstar with the Raiders, the defense is still elite, like not good. It's still an elite defense. That's where, yeah, that's where it's like people who say he's lost it. If that were true, the defense would be terrible, like just not good at all. And that hasn't been the case. Yeah. Well, let's get to the last one then. PMP. We got the Panthers score a season high 30 points. Bryce Young, uh, 36 for 23, 312 yards, career high. Um, rushing, total rushing by the Panthers, 96 yards. Uh, 40 attempts, 30, uh, well, 40 drop back passes, 36 attempts, 23 completions. Listen to this under pressure. Out of his 36 attempts, under pressure 35% of the time, 12 attempts, seven completions for 84 yards, scrambled for a little bit. Watching the game was, 
had his ups and downs. It was good. It was bad. The guy I love that stepped up for the first time this year, DJ Chart, six catches, 98 yards, two touchdowns. Came on at the end of the end of the game, but didn't look great in the beginning. DJ Chark also is feeling healthy. Here's a guy, seventh or eighth year in the league. And here's what I'm going to say. I love what DJ Chark did. He's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Panthers fans, rightfully so, complaining about the receivers, can't do this, can't do that. I'm going to tell you, DJ Chark is a guy who has a ton of speed. I don't think he was all the way healthy in the beginning of the year. If you, I, I watched him in person. That foot was really bothering him. And so when he's decelerating, you kind of see him a little bit, be a little gimpy. That's what I saw, and that's why his hamstring up, up and down. He wasn't 100% all the time. Throws off your hips, and just everything is out of whack, right? Lower back, all of that. But someone said something, right? I, I think I heard someone say, but man. I watched him in practice, and he does well. Of course he's doing well in practice. You know what I'm about to say, huh? Well, who is he going against? <laughs> J.C. Horn has been out. Dante Jackson has been out a few times. He's going against C.J. Henderson. A lot of people are beating C.J. Henderson every Sunday. Sometimes I will ask this question and people don't like it. Who's he going against in practice? That will dictate. The problem is he's not going against those individuals in practice. So your practice against against sometimes people that are easier than the opponent that you're playing, which is much harder. Sure. In the game you're playing in the practice, you may be playing against a guy who's playing checkers. But in the game, you're playing chess. And the chess player is damn Bobby Fischer. That's hard. That's difficult. But to see these guys, the way they play, stay on rhythm, stay resilient, it was really good to watch. It was an exciting game. I'm watching a game from the studio, big screen, watching like 9 million different games, and I'm high-fiving and excited. But you can see they lost the game, however, you can see the talent that is there from some players, and you can see some areas that they need improvement. Yeah, I mean, late in the season, I think it's good to see him still fighting like this. Season's been over a while, second coach, but it's still a rookie quarterback. That's still the future you're building upon. So I think as a fan, it's good to see, okay, yeah, this is something we can build upon. This is something we can point to next year when we see hopefully more leaps in the right direction. Yeah, I'm excited about the team. I think it'll be good. Uh, <laughs> Interested to see how everything just kind of lays out. What do you get? That was believable. Me? Yeah. <laughs> that is yeah, amazing. I'm excited about the team. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, it's tough, bro. It's tough. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Oh, is. my gosh. You want them to be tough. better. That's oh. that's understandable. And I'm sure Jags oh, fans want them to look better. They're uh, It's tough. Which Jags are you referring to? Steve's Jags or Jags? Uh, <laughs> Jacksonville. We're going we we to move past that. Well, let's, yeah. let's cut it to week 17. All righty. Uh, uh, listen, the Jacksonville Jaguars are in trouble. They need to they, they need to figure it out. Well, more of the comments That's after the mean. game that were troubled. Like, the play on the field's one thing. After the game, we talked about the finger pointing earlier when things are going good. It's everyone when, yeah. when times are bad. Times are tough right now for the Jags, and it's a lot of this. It's a lot of Spider-Man. <laughs> Everyone's pointing at everyone else. It's the issue. And it's like, ah, that, that's not, we're about to get the playoffs. Like the Jags, I don't know who they think they are. It's a Jacksonville game. <laughs> you guys are going to most likely, unless they really blow these last two, make the playoffs. So let's uh let's remember where we come from here for a little bit. Yeah, that, that thing is that thing's iffy right now with the Jags. Real iffy. But um, Lions Cowboys, we got but so let's talk twenty one combined wins yeah. here. I am... Um... There's a lot of Cowboys fans that were disappointed. I never I never thought the Cowboys would win a football game. And the reason why I did not believe the Cowboys would win a football game, the Miami Dolphins, whether whatever you think about them, they have so much speed. You go back and look at why the Seahawks were able 
to be competitive against the Cowboys, the Philadelphia Eagles, the San Francisco 49ers, speed. Stephon Gilmore is a lockdown corner, mm-hmm. but he does he's not, he can't run step for step with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Watt. Right. I thought the I thought the Phil, the the Dolphins just had a little bit more speed on offense. But what really surprised me more than anything is Dak never seemed never seemed or got comfortable. The same way Brock Purdy right. never was able to be comfortable to be able to go through his progressions without someone being in his face. He didn't have that same bounce that he usually has when he's sitting in the pocket. He was under duress a lot, and they got after him. So the game was won and lost in the trenches. Same way the the 49ers game, the Eagles game, if if you're going to lose the battle in the trenches and it becomes very apparent in the first two series, it makes it very difficult to win a football game. The Cowboys in the first couple of series against the Philadelphia Eagles, you saw very quickly what in the first game. Oh, pass rush is getting there. But when the Cowboys were able to slow down and neutralize that pass rush and run the football against the Eagles, that's where the ties change and the game start. The moment you, you felt the momentum change. I don't think, even though the game was close, I don't necessarily, I never really felt that the Cowboys were going to win the game. I felt they gave themselves a chance, but I never really felt that they were going to win the game. And, and that may not make sense to people. Sure. But when I say feel like they're ever won the game, it's where you you can see the play calling, you can see the momentum, you can see the defense. I felt at some point in the game for the Cowboys, it was a hope someone steps up and makes a play. Where the 49ers, the same way. Mm-hmm. I hope someone steps up and make a play. The Ravens, the Eagles, uh, 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 the, the Cowboys and Dolphins game. Right, the Lions and Chiefs game back early in the year. Mm-hmm. There were those times where you said it's just going to be a matter of time. Somebody's going to step up and make a play. But against the Chiefs and the Lions, remember that first game when they were beating them, you were going, you could feel Kansas City, Kansas City against the Raiders, Cowboys against the Dolphins. You can. You can hear and see people going, hmm, I'm not sure if we will make a play. I mean, Ravens, Dolphins, this is, we got a, a pretty loaded week in terms of teams that are going to be playing in the playoffs, maybe playing each other again in a couple of weeks. Dolphins, Ravens, one seed's going to be on the line here. If the Ravens hold it right now yeah, yeah. and they're a game apart, uh, would be nice to have a week off. I think everyone wants that week off. Yeah, especially with Mike Andrews being there, Rodney Stanley still, you know, he's out there. They did some tendency breakers too. Put Rodney Stanley, who's a left tackle, they put him on the right side, ran some plays. The Ravens did a really good job of literally throwing the kitchen sink at the kitchen sink at the 49ers. Mm-hmm. And the 49ers ducked. Looked unprepared. They didn't have a plumber on site, right? We knew we was doing plumbing in the stub in at the new unit today, but nobody seen that it went to work. First half, it was a really good game. Second half, I'm I want to see how does how do the how does Mike McDonald, defense coordinator, slow down the Miami Dolphins the way he slowed down. The San Francisco 49ers. Now, they're a faster team, obviously, the Dolphins, than the 49ers. But the 49ers are just as explosive sure. as the Miami Dolphins. And will they be able to do this two weeks in a row? Yeah, and I, I saw a couple people saying last night, uh, Trent Williams is Trent Williams. The other four guys, just attack them, and then you can go get Purdy. And that seems to be what the Ravens did. 
can they do that against the Dolphins? I don't see why not. So next week breaks next week's breakdown is Gabe Davis, mm-hmm. what he's doing, and then I'm gonna go back and look at because uh, it, it's not loaded up yet. I want to go back and look all look at all the routes Zay Flowers ran against the San Francisco 49ers and tell you why was it so special. Mm-hmm. Remember last remember in October I talked about the San Francisco 49ers and their secondary is oh, their yeah. liability. Isaiah, I, uh, was Isaiah Oliver? You know, he former first round draft pick, former second round draft pick, I believe, out of Colorado. It doesn't matter. Somebody, if I'm incorrect, somebody will tell me. How dare he forget? <laughs> it doesn't matter. He ain't playing. How about that? Uh, they put Brown out there. They put some other guys. Jason uh, Barrett, he's back. They've been listening to 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 me because. They are trying to figure out how, and then with Tafunga going down, yeah, that hurt. how do they figure out? Because Zay was going off. My, them dudes out there on that island on the, uh, for the San Francisco 49ers, the corners, mm-mm-mm, did not. And, and, you, and there was a play, Lamar was scampering over, and my son was like, he needs to throw the ball. And I was like, throw the ball. And then you see Zay Flowers is getting held, spins. They're off schedule plays that they have with Lamar. They're starting to practice it. It's starting to look like how Russell Wilson used to make those impactful off schedule plays. I just hope that that practice doesn't turn into the style of football because we've seen, sure. like out of Russell Wilson, when you start to adapt that more than the traditional drop back passes, then when you're required to do it, you don't look as sharp. Right, right, right. I see Steelers, Seahawks here. That feels like both teams are eight and seven. That seems like who's going to lose less is going to win that game. You know what I mean? Who's going to be less incompetent for for 60 minutes is going to end up winning that game. The real game I'm interested in is Packers, Vikings. That has playoff implications. Both teams are seven and eight. Yeah, that's – I mean, this is either going to be the Packers finishing third or they they sneak into the back end of the playoffs. That's that's how I'm looking at it. For me, it has to be the Bengals at Chiefs. Yeah. And here's what I want to see. I believe this is an opportunity. Is this Jake Browning opportunity going to turn into that Cooper Rush where you start to go, this backup quarterback can play? in the NFL, or it's like, eh, maybe he just, they just wasn't enough game plan on sure. him. Sure, yeah, not enough tape. And so he's just a backup. I, Jake Browning, if, uh, Zach Taylor's another offensive-minded guy, mm-hmm. Lou, Aro- Lou uh, Anarumo, will, Anarumo, he will be a head coach as well. Mm-hmm. He's allowed that guy to manage the whole defense, yep. right? I want to see the quarterback we've seen in the last two games, Jake Browning, is that the real quarterback? Or is it the kid who was out there dropping dimes or it just kind of surprised everybody? Yeah, that. Right, a guy who's been. I was going to say that that Bengals-Vikings game became so fun because it was two backups. And even in in the Vikings case, the backup to the backup, just slinging it. Just no care in the world. They were oh, Akuna <laughs> yeah, they, they and it, it resulted like T. Higgins said that crazy touchdown where he yep. goes behind the back to reach for the pylon. Um, the Vikings had a couple crazy ones. I if you're gonna be a backup, play like there's no tomorrow. I don't want to see this conservative stuff. I don't want to see these check that throw it, throw the ball. It's gonna be your team's only <laughs> chance and your only chance to really last in the league. Man, performance anxiety. Not everybody has For it, sure. Man. No, I understand. It's way easier I, said I was, by me sitting here than them out there on the fields. And if you didn't think before I end this show that I was not going to mention, who's the starting quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons for the remainder of the uh, season? Not, not DoorDash Ritter. I know that much. <laughs> Why are you calling him? Because his agent, maybe the worst job ever. They got him a DoorDash endorsement where he's in the commercial, literally delivering food to people. If they don't know how the internet's going to take that, if and when he eventually gets his job taken, 
that's not they shouldn't be in the agent business. The for the lack of foresight there is incredible. The second I saw that commercial with him delivering food to someone, and I already think he's not that good. Yeah, that's gonna follow him <laughs> the rest of his life. Like that's that's a tough scene. You can't set your own guy up like so that. You, so so you saying he just screwed up some folks' order? <laughs> Yeah, he's delivering <laughs> blocks away. He's he's not even going to the right address. He's he's, he's calling. Him, uh, I can't read this. I can't read these numbers. What is it? Yeah, what? folks are writing like, please call when you get here. If you ring the bell, my dogs bark. He's knocking. He's pounding like the cops are trying to do a raid. <laughs> he's just not. It's not the best. Oh. I thought you were gonna bring up. Uh, I know you're an L.A. guy. I thought you were going to bring up the hurricane known as the Boston Celtics that just ran through the city of Los Angeles this weekend, thumping <laughs> the Clippers by 30 points and then beating the Lakers on Christmas. I thought that's what you were going to talk about, but I guess we'll get to that another time. I was I was avoiding that. I was avoiding that. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was so hoping you didn't mention I that. almost came in here dressed when like they, Lucky today. I almost had the full <laughs> St. Patrick's Day fit on. <laughs> Bro, we, when he lost to the Clippers, I was like, oh. Lost to the Lakers, I was like, well, misery loves company. <laughs> yeah, at least they beat them, too. You can't have the Lakers beating us. That yeah. makes it look way worse. <laughs> So, yeah, my, my Clippers are struggling. My Clippers are Kawhi struggling. didn't play. It would have only been like a 30 point or 20 point loss I, if he had played. So, you got to think of the positives. <laughs> hey, I'm Steve Smith Sr. Nick. We're out of here.